Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Senior Pastor Rev. Dale Cohen. Hey, I want to welcome you to the First Words podcast of First United Methodist Church in Florence, Alabama. I'm Dale Cohen, Senior Pastor, and we're continuing our series on Faces of Jesus. And today I'm going to be talking about Image of the Father. And towards the end of the message, I'll share about piece of art that's inspired this message today, and uh, you'll be able to go to the website and take a look uh, at that. Um, I want to use John chapter 14, verses 8 through 11. Philip said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My dad was a jack of all trades. He worked as a machinist, a draftsman, a technical advisor on repairing factory machinery, and as a building superintendent. He was also an amateur cabinet maker, auto mechanic, electrician, plumber, and general handyman. As a young boy, I spent every Saturday helping my dad with various projects from rebuilding automobile engines to framing decks. My jobs included flashlight holder, tool fetcher, tape measure operator, or board positioner. Whenever we worked together, I remember watching my dad's hands, marveling at the skillful way he wielded every tool. I like to work with my hands, too. I'm not nearly as talented as my father was, but I love to make things. A few years after his death, I was working on a project When, to my surprise, as I was ripping a board on my table saw, I thought I was looking at my father's hands before I realized I was looking at my own. It was a bittersweet moment as I recognized how much my father is also a part of me. While we recognize the traits and characteristics we inherited from our parents, the Bible teaches that we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. One characteristic we inherited from them is a rebellious nature that leads to sin. In Romans, we read, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that is Adam, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. This passage says that because of Adam's rebellion against God, the sin that flowed from his rebellion has been passed on to us. Since sin leads to death and destruction, we're subject to the limits of our humanity, which, unfortunately, includes the inevitability of death. Now, before we get too depressed about our eventual demise, the passage in Romans leaves out the best part of our inheritance. Since Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, God's image is also passed on to us in this genetic transfer. Yes, We inherited sin, but before that, we inherited the image of God. We're not entirely doomed because we're created in the image of God. However, we must all come to grips with the rebellion and the sin we've inherited, or it will destroy us. Four preachers from a small town decided to go on a retreat, spending a couple of days fishing at a cabin. One evening by the fire, the Methodist preacher asked the others about their biggest temptations. The Baptist preacher said, Well, it's embarrassing, but my big temptation is gluttony. I can't say no to fried foods. My temptation is worse, said the Presbyterian preacher. It's gambling. I bet on everything. Mine is even worse, said the Episcopal priest. I can't resist a good stiff bourbon. I'll drink the whole bottle in one sitting. They turned to the Methodist preacher who paused and then said, I hate to tell you this, but I love to gossip. And if you'll excuse me, I need to go make a few phone calls. We all struggle with sin. 
Now, I think it's essential that we begin with a definition of sin. Most of the time, we think about sin simply in terms of forbidden behaviors. We even have a list of the worst sins referred to as the seven deadly sins, pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. The problem with this list is that there is no sin any deadlier than another. There are no degrees to sin. Sin is sin. All sins cause harm. That's why I want to offer this definition of sin. Sin is anything we do that hurts or destroys our relationships, including our relationships with God, others, ourselves, and creation. Sin is rooted in selfishness that rebels against the natural laws of healthy relationships designed to protect us from harming ourselves and others. In this definition, sin is not simply forbidden behavior. Think about it. Some behaviors are appropriate in one relationship, but inappropriate in another. The most obvious example is in marriage, where sexual intimacy is encouraged and accepted. However, it's not appropriate for either partner to engage in sexual intimacy with anyone other than their spouse. Doing so diminishes both relationships. This situational complexity requires a level of consciousness and awareness that can be exhausting. That's why most of us prefer to operate from a clear-cut list of do's and don'ts. It's even better if the list of don'ts encompasses only those behaviors we're not tempted to do. Focusing on other people's worst sins allows us to conveniently turn a blind eye to our own. But remember, sin is sin, and no sin is worse than another. Our view of the problem of sin is not nearly as important as God's view. Christian tradition has two basic perspectives regarding sin. In the first, God views sin as a violation of divine law in need of punishment, so that once the penalty is paid, presumably by Jesus on the cross to God the Father, the offending person is restored to righteousness. God views sin in the second perspective as a deadly disease in need of healing, so that once the doctor, again Jesus, provides a treatment that cures the disease, presumably his unconditional love and forgiveness demonstrated through submission to death on the cross, then the sick person is restored to health and wholeness. There are plenty of scriptures in support of both views. The perspective of sin as a violation of law requiring a penalty or payment is evident in two mandatory sacrifices prescribed in the Old Testament. You can find these in Leviticus 4, 5, and 6, and chapters 14 and 19. The sin offering is the first of these mandatory sacrifices, and it atones for one's sins and cleanses oneself from the defilement caused by contact with any unclean persons or things. The second is the trespass offering, which atones for unintentional sins that require the offender to reimburse an offended party for their loss and damages. The second perspective of sin as a deadly disease in need of healing is supported in Matthew's Gospel, where we read this story. And as Jesus sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. The four Gospels are filled with stories of Jesus healing the sick. The same people who were written off as having somehow offended God and others attributing their sickness to their sin. So Jesus not only healed them, but he also forgave them of their sins. Because sick people were segregated from society, Jesus healed them, he forgave their sins, 
and he restored them in their relationships with their families, communities, and yes, even with God. It would be easy to say that the first perspective is an Old Testament one, while the second perspective is from the New Testament. However, we see evidence of these perspectives in both Testaments. So, which one best demonstrates God's view of sin? I think this question is at the heart of Philip's request for Jesus in today's Gospel lesson. Philip grew up believing that God was a God of judgment whose righteousness demanded justice. Philip always thought God was angry with him over his sin. However, hanging out with Jesus, who claimed to be the Son of God, seemed to be painting a more gracious picture of God. Philip was confused, so he wanted Jesus and God the Father to stand side by side so he could compare the two. Let's reread what Philip said. He said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. It's like Philip was saying, I want to believe that you're God's son, but you act nothing like the God I was taught to believe in. How can I trust you because you're so different from what I thought you would be? Philip was drawn to the grace he found in Jesus, but it still felt foreign to him. So he needed to verify that Jesus really was God's son. Then John's gospel continues. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. You can hear the disappointment in Jesus' voice at how Philip and the other disciples fail to see the compassionate nature of his Father as it's expressed in Jesus. The whole purpose for Jesus coming into our world as a human being was for us to see God for who he is, not as some projection of a distant and angry deity, but as an engaging and loving presence who is for us and not against us. In the same way that Jesus delights in sharing with his followers, God also delights in his relationship with us. So Jesus pleads with Philip, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Jesus tells Philip that everything he's seen him do should prove that Jesus and the Father are one. But even if he can't make that leap of faith, at least believe that the miracles and transformations that Jesus performed are God's handiwork, God's work through Jesus. Throughout human history, people have missed the point of who God is. God spoke through the law and then through the kings and prophets, but most people still misunderstood God's true nature. We continually try to make God in our image so that God is nothing more than a slightly better version of ourselves. We know we've created God in our image when God loves only the people we love and hates the people we hate. We need a more accurate image of God. So God sent his son into the world to show us who he really is. The writer of Hebrews wrote, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. So from that I draw that if we want to know who God is, we need only look to Jesus, for he is the exact imprint of God's very being. Jesus didn't seek to punish people for their sins. He sought to heal people of their rebellious and sinful ways through regeneration of their hearts. Sin is its own punishment. 
What we need is relief. So Jesus came to show us a better way, the way of love and forgiveness. Martha Beadle's mixed media fabric art was the inspiration for this message. She calls it Rock of Ages, and this is what she wrote about it. Jesus is our rock of ages, our rock that doesn't wear away with time. From generation to generation, he is forever present in our lives. The gray fabric represents strong stones that do not crumble under heat or pressure or under the trials of our modern day lives, stones that are not washed away by the storms of life or floods of grief. The shells in the piece represent clefts in the rocks out of which flow the waters of salvation. Jesus is like a cleft in a rock. He is our hiding place and eternal refuge. In this portrait, Jesus is wearing a golden crown surrounded by purple fabric to represent royalty and honor. On his neck are three crosses, symbolizing the crosses on which Christ and the other two men were crucified. The rose represents the sweet fragrance of knowing Christ as our Lord and Savior. I love Martha's art because it's always whimsically profound. Her Jesus is relatable and approachable while not minimizing his divinity. His godness is communicated through the symbols that frame his face and adorn his body. Martha elevates Jesus' holiness while grounding his humanity. In her art, Jesus looks like somebody I can turn to who will be there for me to heal my brokenness and restore me to God. That's the God I believe in, and I invite you to believe in him too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Thanks for joining us for this episode of First Words. Please reach out to us if there's anything that we can do for you. We would love to hear from you. And join us next week for the next episode. Take care. Thank you for listening to First Word. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc. Thank you.